let us pray. And um, I put some things out there, the handout that we gave on Monday night. If you happen to not be here Monday night, here's the most important thing you need to know. This women's conference that we're doing is going to be unbelievable. It's going to be really great. It's in February. I know that seems like it's really far away, but we only get 300 tickets at the lower ticket price. So don't wait forever to get your ticket. I mean, those tickets will probably be gone by December, um, which I know that even seems like it's far away, but it's really not, especially if you go to Hobby Lobby. It's like, <laughs> everybody's buying Christmas stuff. I'm like, why are you buying Christmas stuff? It's there. there. I, it's there and I'm still <laughs> putting fall up. So, um, so anyhow, if, if you want some handouts on that, it's a great conference to bring um, friends that may not go to a lot of church things. It's super, Jennifer does an incredible job um, being engaging and creating. Honestly, it's the best conference I've ever been to. So um, I'm super excited about it. And so. It, I know. Well, we kind of. We were vague on purpose. Thank you. And yeah, there's, yeah, sorry, there's one kind of, the, here's the reason why our ticket prices are lower than everybody else's. I figured Because we're the host church. So we didn't make a big deal about ticket price because we had all the other co-host churches there. So that's why we did beg you to buy tickets that night because our tickets are a little less. So you buy tickets up at the FLC desk. That's a weird place, isn't it? Yeah, it's because we don't have our receptionists. We miss them so much on a regular basis in the main building. And if we get another flare up of COVID, that office will shut down before this would shut down. So um, this is the more secure place to buy tickets. Eight, and they're open eight to five, Monday through Friday. So you can buy them anytime. And there's a limit of 10. Not that you would want more than that, but there is a limit of 10. So, and that's all we get at that price. So once those are gone, then we have to pay the higher prices. And we can buy them Monday through Friday? Yes, Monday through Friday. Oh, and I'm sorry, I'll have them Sunday at the information desk as well. Yeah, <coughs> but we can't have an online option just because that's fine. Okay. it's actually I mean, I'm something. I'm sure I'm not the only person that wants them. No, no, yep, yeah. and we were vague so on Sunday purpose. Sunday they're not here. Sunday they're uh, Sunday they'll be at the main information desk. It's just during the week here. Adam said that him and Heath and their staff would sell them for us, which is super nice. But um, check or cash. Yeah, I'm so sorry. No credit card. Yeah. Yes, isn't that good? It's $39, so you either have to get a dollar worth of change back or write a check. All right, so yes, they're now available. Heath and Adam have them, and I'll have them on Sunday. So, all right, so let's pray. Father God, we um, are so thankful to be together and we are so thankful for the reality of our salvation that we have seen just um, be explained beautifully by Paul in the book of Romans. I thank you, God, that um, his desire was to get to Rome, to be with these believers, and because he was prohibited from doing so, he ended up writing this book to lay down a foundation for them of um, theology and relationship with the law, um, truths about our salvation, and I just thank you for um, this amazing book. And God, we pray as we go into chapter 6 that we really would understand this life of sanctification and even though Paul doesn't use that particular word um, a lot in the book of Romans, really this chapter is all about how to live um, differently, how to live a sanctified life and the power to do that. And God, I just pray that that would make a difference in our lives, those nagging things that are still in our lives that frustrate us, that um, we would see truth in the next few weeks that would just um, break um, just bondage in our life that we've had for years 
And um, God, we love you, and we just thank you for the opportunity to be together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, Michelle's not here to check you in, and I, I don't want all of you touching the same highlighter, so I'm just going to check all of y'all in because I know who's in the room. Um, so, all right, so we're really excited that we're going to really cover all of <laughs> Chapter 6 tonight. Believe it or not, we're going to do it. And um, there will be a couple times where I will kind of um, – not drill into those verses only because I know what homework you have coming up this next week. And so I don't want to spoil any of your fun. And But I will, a couple places, drill in a little bit deeper because I know we may not come back to those verses again. Does that make sense? So if I'm kind of loosely going over verses, it's because it's in your homework coming up. So... Basically, there's two questions that Paul asks, and he, he asks the, these, both of these questions with wanting the response of, of course not. That's a ridiculous thought, basically. And the two questions that he asks are in verse 1 and then again in verse 15. So I've kind of broken this lesson up into looking at each one of those questions. So the first question comes out of chapter 1, and let's just read that. I'm sorry, verse 1. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? Are we to continue in sin? And that word continue there means to habitually um, live in. It's a habitual sitting in or habitual living in. And so the question that Paul is asking, should we just continue to sin habitually, make it our permanent residence so that grace might increase? Now, in your lesson, we've talked about these, this two group of people a couple different times, and we have the Judaizers, correct? And by the name Judaizers, what are they wanting to do? Follow the law. They're wanting to follow the law. Mainly our Jewish um, Christians that would, would have been in this church, and they're wanting to add the law um, to the gospel. And he's going to address them. But really, this chapter is to the other group. The whole chapter is really written to the antinomians, the ones who are anti-law, right? Nomia, noma means law, antinomians, they're anti-law, meaning that they believe that you can get saved, you can um, have Christ's justification, as we were talking about, and then walk away and live however you want to live. And the more you sin, it just allows God's grace to be poured out more. And they actually had this crazy idea that the more they sinned, the more God would forgive us, and the more he would forgive us, the more it would bring him glory. Okay? Now I know that doesn't make any sense to a lot of you, but that was kind of their train of thought. That the more they messed up, the more they were kind of testing God, the more he could forgive them, and really, the better he looked. Look how, look how great God is that he forgives me for these things. And even the most severe antinomians, um, they even believed that their body had nothing to do with their spirit. So they completely disconnected everything that they did in their body with their spiritual being so that there was a complete break between the two. And so that would be the heightened um, version of this. And so, which by the way, is not too hard to believe because that's what people still kind of think these days, right? Um, and then the second question he asks, and you can read it there, verse 15, what then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? And he answers it again, may it never be. And so 
he is saying, and what's really interesting there is you see the law there is the little l. And it really, it, Paul's really making an argument here that it's not even whether you're under the Jewish law. It's that they're saying we're not under any moral restraint at all. It wasn't even the Jewish law that they were wanting to throw off. It was any moral restraint whatsoever. And so Paul is going to go on following verse 15 and make that argument. So that's kind of how we're going to divide it up is between those two topics of discussion. And so the first thing he wants them to know with this whole idea of are we to continue in sin that grace might increase. And within this, you may be saying, well, I, you know, that's not my hang-up. I don't think either one of those things. But the beauty of this is that Paul is going to tell us things that are going to help us and even our everyday struggles. It, he literally is going to give us things that I really think that if we understand, it will revolutionize how we live and how we consider this life of after we walk out justified, right? So we're, we're in that courtroom, right? And God looks at us and he justifies us, right? And it, he, he tells us, he puts Christ's righteousness on us. And now what we're going to talk about is after we walk out, what does that life look like after? And you can imagine that in people's thoughts, well, if grace is so easy, then why not keep sinning? That was easy, right? If all I have to do is believe, that seems easy. So I can keep believing and live however I wanna live. That's literally their argument, which by the way, is a lot of people's argument of how they want to live however they wanna live. And that's why when we're discussing with people really the definition of faith and belief, as it's defined for us in scripture, it is something that's not just a mental assent. Because I can believe in a lot of things. It's a belief that changes my behavior. And going back to that whole silly chair illustration, I can believe that's a chair, I can admire it's a chair, but the actual submitting to and surrendering that change of behavior at that point is where we put our faith in Christ. We believe in him in a way that it has changed our even our positioning of our own selves. Does that make sense at all? I use that illustration, it was really funny. Some of you may have even been there up in when we were meeting over in the other building on the second floor and the stool was broken. And it broke and I almost <laughs> fell. And, and I laughed and I said, well, it's a good thing that our Savior will never, he'll never let us fall, right? Like once we surrender to him, um, we will never. And so we're going to kind of use that as we go through this of how we can live um, in such a way that we live differently. You'd like to think that if the worst criminal in the whole world came in and, and he knew, like the wages of sin is death, death right? He knew that he des deserved the death penalty. And yet, the judge not only forgives him of sin, but he justifies him, which again, humanly is not even possible because justified means just as if I've never even done the sin. Now, can you imagine if he walked out and then just started committing the same crime of which he was in the courtroom for? And yet, that is what we do um, with and we cheapen. In fact, Hebrews talks about that and it talks about cheapening God's grace, trampling his grace. So let's start. Verse two, he answers the question, 
remember I said you have to kind of raise your voice when you read it because it really is like a statement of outrage. He says, are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So that that's the big question. And he's going to unpack for us, well, what do you mean, Paul, that we've died to sin? And even there, when you see how shall we who, it doesn't say who are dying to sin, does it? It says how shall we who have what? Died, it's past tense. So you could write above that, we have already died to sin. How shall we still live in it? So his question is, how are you still living in something that you have already died to? Past tense. And he says, or do you not know? And, and that's one of the things you're going to look up next um, week in your homework, that, that word know. He says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Now, I'm just going to read these verses, and I'm going to show some self-control and not say a word about them because they are next week's work. And I'll want to. I'll want to stop and, and talk about them, but I'm not going to. We're just going to read them and move on. He says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we also will be, I'm, I'm adding words, sorry, be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him and that our body of sin might be done away with that we are no longer to be slaves to sin that we should no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is freed from sin so I want you to think about it this way, that there's two fields, and we, we talked about this a little bit last week, that there is this dominion, this, is this, this economy, this area in which we live before we come to Christ. And this, this field that we were working in and that we were slaves to, this field was of this world, belongs to Satan belongs to this world by the way it only belongs to him because God lets it occur that way and that there's a road in between these two fields and this road right here is our salvation it is this point that we're going to talk about next week that we are identified with Christ and when we walk across that road there's newness of life there's a new realm of living. And we're now in this other field. Now we're gonna keep, keep, kind of keep this illustration tonight as we unpack this chapter. And what he says is, he who has died is free from sin. Now think about that very practically, that if you're now over here as an employee, as a slave of a new master, what does that mean? You don't have to answer to this master anymore, right? When, I mean, do any of your old bosses from your prior employment call you up and try to boss you around, right? They don't. Why do they not? All right, now y'all, that is brilliant. Think about that. They don't have the authority over you anymore. 
What did you say, Fern? You don't belong to them anymore. You don't belong to them anymore. By the way, we don't belong over here anymore because why? We've been redeemed. We've been bought out of that. And so we now get to live here. And so look at what it says. He says, verse 8, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with them. So let's talk about for just a minute. We're going to talk about it more next week. But when it says there, verse 8, now we have died with Christ, what, what do you think that that he's, what do you think he's talking about there? That we've died with Christ. It's referring to what he just said before about our old self being crucified with him. Absolutely. So in our, and let's move on because it's all <laughs> next week. But I promise that's going to make sense next week. So we're going to start verse 9 because we will not talk about verse 9 next week. <laughs> Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. So let's think about this for just a minute. He says that Christ, having been raised from the dead, that's the resurrection, correct? Is never to die again. Now, and, and the question is going to be in just a minute. Death is no longer master over him. Now, we know that Jesus will never die again. And we, one of the things that we talk about, that we believe, is that we have eternal life. Which means that if I was to die tonight that I would live eternally with God. I mean, immediately when my body would die, my spirit would go to live with God, right? And I, death no longer has reign or master over my life, just like it didn't over Christ's life. So now in this realm right here, I can lose my physical life but I can't ever lose my spiritual life. I can't ever die again because uh, my eternal life lives forever. And he goes on, and I'm going to ask y'all to help me unpack some things. He says, and here comes my big question that I had. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Any ideas where I struggled in that verse? Where do you all struggle in that verse? Once for all. Okay. Once for all. That his salvation, that his death was once for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And didn't he always live yeah. to God? You know, even in his human existence, wasn't he always living to God? Yeah, free from sin. Right? Uh, yeah, so anyhow, I'm telling you what my struggles were. My struggle was more related to that, Beth, in that it says that he died to sin. Um, and I, I, I kind of was worried with that a little bit or it could you know it did seem right to me because to die to sin makes me feel like sin had power over him does that make sense yeah. wasn't he also tempted he was tempted he no longer be tempted that's exactly right Perhaps yeah you're so smart <laughs> took me a while to get there so I, that's exactly right it wasn't until his resurrection that Christ completely destroyed the power that sin has, not only over him, but he, he literally broke the chokehold of sin. And he broke it in, in his own self. So he, he, he 
the not only the present because here's the thing Jesus never is going to live in the presence of sin again he's up in heaven not living in the presence of sin and he also broke the power of sin and so in the resurrection the ability for sin to have any dominion was gone and now he lives to God completely in the realm of God and sin no longer has master over his dominion now what's so important about that is that Paul is in a minute gonna say guess what you're the same way and that makes us that stresses us out a little bit because we're like but we still struggle with sin right but look at what he says in the next verse like just read this verse it is a challenge even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus now the great um, illustration of this consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus is really Lazarus do you remember when Lazarus came back to life what was the one thing that Lazarus what did Jesus immediately say to the people surrounding what did they tell him, them to do to Lazarus absolutely take his grave clothes off right and because here's the thing how ridiculous would it have been for Lazarus to walk around as a live person still wrapped up in dead grave clothes and this is kind of what Paul's point is here if we consider ourselves to truly be alive to God why are we still walking around with these grave clothes wrapped around us pieces of our former dead life and I, I want to go back to this whole field illustration because I'm a simple girl and it helps me understand it that if you can imagine in this field having some kind of horrible uniform that you had to wear that made your work so much harder and then all of a sudden coming over to this field and God saying you don't need to work and giving you like something super comfortable like pajamas right mm -hmm. to do your work in which I always think I should have gone into the medical um, thing because I want to just work in scrubs like my goal is to wear pajamas every day of my life pajamas and tennis shoes unfortunately I did not get a job where I can do that y'all would be worried about me if I wore pajamas and tennis shoes every day but here if, if all of a sudden you're working and living the life in this new field and you constantly want to put back on everything that came off when you came over to the new realm of existence ladies that is sort of what we do when we want to like get ourselves all underneath encumbered with sins in our life that God has said this is this place of, of freedom bondage breaking you can live here and work here and not be under this sin area that you did live and work in and that's what makes verse 12 possible read verse 12 with me he says therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body now when it says reign there what does that word mean be in control right it means that it it's the one on the throne so I love to just think about putting that verse in that context do not let sin be on the throne in your mortal body that you should obey 
its lusts. And do not go on, and he's going to use this word presenting a bunch. And I want you to, every time he says presenting, I kind of want you to think about the word yielding or giving yourself over to. Because that's really what that word presenting means. It means you're yielding yourself over to it. You're giving yourself over to it. Like if I was to say I'm present to you so-and-so, that has a different connotation, and that's kind of how we use the word presenting. So I like the idea of letting something have control of you, yielding yourself to it. And it says, do not go on yielding or presenting your members of the body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present <clears throat> yourself to God as those alive from the dead, just like Lazarus, right? And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So look at, look at those verses and just kind of tell me, flesh out those verses for me. I'm way off my slides, aren't I? I'm so sorry. Um, flesh out for me those verses on what does it mean to not let sin how, do, how can we not let sin reign in the members of our body and how can we not yield the members of our body to sin Absolutely. Those things that we just are like, see that? That's, you know, that's human. My, my dad would always say that's human nature. And, you know, whenever I'm thinking in my brain, well, it's, it's natural to feel that way. Or it's, I always check myself and say, you know, because we're, we've got to be better than human nature, right? Uh, last Wednesday, there was a guest speaker in the youth service. We're going to go in here we loud behind. Yeah. Um, and he said, he was talking about uh, sin and claiming it as what it is. And he said, God doesn't forgive weakness. He only forgives sin. And I was like, oh, that got all over me. Like, mm -hmm. you can't go to God and say, I'm just weak. I'm just saying, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. You're not asking for forgiveness for sin. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is so good. Yeah. It really stuck with me. That is really mm -hmm. good. He doesn't forgive weakness. God doesn't forgive weakness. He only forgives sin. Mm -hmm. So if you don't. If you don't call it what it is, if you just say, it, you it yeah, I'm just weak in that area. And yeah. I think yeah. it, to jump off of that, we have to be aware that it is a battle. Mm -hmm. I mean, for I'm a little bit confused. I have to reflect more on these verses because I'm like, well, why it's such a battle? Mm -hmm. So we have to be aware that it is a battle, that we have an enemy, that um, and we have these patterns of, of weakness, but we also have strength that's not ours. Right. And so it's so we have no excuse kind of for calling it weakness because yeah. it, our, it, our strength is not ours. If we have God, then we have his strength. I, I totally agree. And I, I also like this idea of honestly being an instrument of unrighteousness or an instrument of righteousness. And I think the fact of it is, is we think we live 90% of the time somewhere in the middle, right? We, we don't think of ourselves really as that. And really, we can either be, and again, what does righteousness mean? It doesn't mean perfect behavior. It means right standing with God. We are instruments that sound like, we reflect that we have right standing with God. Instead of being instruments that demonstrate, that sound like, that show that we do not have right standing with God, that we're unrighteous. So that's so good. And it is, he is going to give us a couple more helps along the way of this. But I, I do think that this idea of letting sin be on the throne of a certain area in our life, that that is what we really need to ask ourselves 
why are we letting sin reign in this area of our lives? Why, why am I constantly presenting myself to this? Constantly giving myself over. If you think of the word yield and you're coming up to a, like a, a roundabout, which by the way, I think before they should let you live in Gatesville, they should give you roundabout lessons. <laughs> So people thoroughly understand the laws of this, what yielding is, that you never stop in the middle of a roundabout, you know, just certain rules. But anyhow, when you're yielding into a roundabout, right, what are you doing? You are not, you are yielding into a situation. And if you look at that, if sin is this roundabout here and you yield, yield into it you are choosing that's what I love about these verses is it says do not go on presenting do not let sin reign um, present yourselves all of those are action words right that we can help it we are not and a lot of times you'll hear people say the devil made me do it because they, they want to give up control because if they give up, like, it wasn't my fault. The devil made me do it, right? But if we say that, what have we taken away? Our personal responsibility, right? We're just weak or, you know, it's just what all people do. This isn't really sin. This is just human nature. And I love that Paul thoroughly says, and, and the reason we can do it is because we are identified with Christ. If you were here Monday night, I, I was talking about that whole passage of being yoked with Jesus um, that he, Jesus talks about in Matthew um, when he says, um, you know, to, to yoke ourselves with him that our burden is light. I guess I never really thought about all the implications of literally a yoke is two things that tie together and and I tell my kids all the time right don't be unequally yoked meaning you don't want someone who's a, you know who doesn't love Jesus like you love Jesus because you'll get pulled back and I started thinking well if anybody's unequally yoked it is Jesus himself because He's the, think about that. You are yoked to, tied to, the God of the universe. How, how easy should our effort be? I, you know, it's a change in perspective that sometimes I feel like God's pulling me and dragging me to somewhere I probably don't want to be. Is that just me? instead of him being right on that yoke with me instead of asking me to be or to do something he literally is right there with me yoked with me it's a real change in perspective for me anyhow so any anything else y'all want to add to that It's such a good word picture, the whole idea of Lazarus. Can you imagine Lazarus going back like two days later and going back and finding? Do y'all hear that music? Yeah. Where is that coming uh, from? I wonder if we adjust that knob. Not that. I think it's kind of Yeah, it's not in here, it's outside. Yeah, but it doesn't sound like their music, does it? Okay. Let's try it that. could also we be someone's that, phone, like a kid's well, phone. Like yeah, that makes more so sense to me, but it's almost like one of you have your phone turned on. Yeah, but it sounds like out there. Yeah. I think that went away. No, it's, no. it's okay. Yeah. 
of that be there for there to be nobody no teenagers out there and so we love that noise so um, I have no idea what I was saying so let's move on yeah I thought I finished that thought it's at least finished in my brain right at this moment again this will all be cut from the tape oh yeah 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 that's it that's a good thought is that like a few days later going back and like I know that sounds ridiculous but literally it's such a word picture for us of wanting to go back and pick up his grave clothes and want to put them back on to think that they would somehow be useful to him or to want to I mean do you think Lazarus when God resurrected him from that death do you think Lazarus did not walk around did he not walk around like a free man? Did he not walk around with the idea that he has been given a second chance on life? And literally, as instruments of righteousness, we have been given this beautiful chance, this beautiful second chance as a new creation. And it is, it's such a, it is really how we think about those things. And Let's read verse 15. He says, see if I can get back on my slides. What then shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? May it never be. <laughs> Do you not know? And it, it's really him saying, is it not self-evident to you that when you present yourselves all right, so when you yield yourself, when you give yourself over as a willing choice to someone as slaves for obedience, that you are the slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. And again i want you to think about those fields and he just says when you're in this field you are a slave of that person who controls the field and that is sin it is death it is the enemy and you the result of that is death and and listen the wages of this is death that's the penalty for working in that field but here, now, he says, but now you're the slave of the one whom you obey. And I, I love that he, he totally is saying this in a common sense way. By the way, we are the slaves of that that we obey. If, just think about this in a very practical way. If all of a sudden you become convinced of something and you start obeying, let's just say a new meal plan, right? A new way of eating. You kind of become what? I, I, this is certainly how I feel when I'm doing this. I became a slave to, right? That which I'm obeying. I now become a slave to it because I'm obeying it. I'm yielding myself over to it. And so I think one of the things that Paul's telling us is key is this. It's, it's as that sin is coming into our lives, are we going to yield ourselves over to it, give ourselves over to it, and to really realize we have a choice. We don't have to yield ourselves. And this is the beautiful thing. When you're in this field, you now have a choice of whether you're gonna yield yourself to sin. Here, you didn't have a choice. You had some choice of whether you wanted to do a righteous act, but you're, you were ungodly. You were unrighteous by nature. You were a child of wrath. But now over here, 
You are a child of God. You are adopted, forgiven, chosen, redeemed, and you're now here, and now it becomes our choice. It now becomes our choice if we're going to yield ourselves, if we're going to present ourselves. And you know what the presenting is? Is it's hanging out with those people that you know don't bring out the best in you. Y'all have those? Everybody has those, right? It is putting yourself in a position to um, knowingly, if you know that somebody is a gossip or whatever, and you call them up, you are presenting yourself to gossip. Does that make sense? There, here's the thing is that before there is sin in our lives, there are a bunch of little choices that lead up to that. Now, we tell our kids that, don't we? But man, we don't want to believe that about ourselves, do we? And so, um, it, it just makes logical sense. And we're gonna, he's going to talk about this in a minute, but I love this little... I love this little um, encouragement, kind of a pump you up statement that Paul does in verse 17. Look what he says. He says, he wants them to know that I know something different about you. He says, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you've become obedient from the heart in that form of teaching to which you were committed. And Paul is really speaking just a very personal word to these in the middle of this theology. He's speaking this personal word to them that he says, but thanks be to God that you crossed the road. Thanks be to God because I've heard about you Romans. I know you're not over here anymore. You are over here. And he says, you've become obedient from the heart, which I, I just hope that all of a sudden you see this little personal message in here because all of a sudden he starts talking about the heart and like, it's just different. It's like this little word of encouragement in the midst of all this. He says, you've become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were committed. Now, that word committed, if that confuses you, I, I looked it up because it confused me, and you're not going to look it up next week. And that really that word is more like another way of saying it is delivered, that that form of teaching to which you were delivered. And I want you to think about that because how did the teaching get to Rome? How did it get to Rome? Y'all know this. If you've been with me, you know this. How did the gospel, the teaching, and that, that form of teaching just basically means the mold. And, and by the way, what Paul's doing here is he's just giving them more mold. He's giving them more form of teaching. But he says, now you know, you know this, because I know it's been delivered to you. This form of teaching has been delivered to you. And I'm asking you all now, how was it delivered to them? How did the gospel make it to Rome? In letters from Rome, Timothy, Theophilus. I love you, but that's not the right answer. Was it the Jews before they were... Do what? What did you say? Good guess. It was a good guess. All the right good people. guess. Yes, it was. <laughs> Go ahead. Before before the the Jews were just sent out. The booth, okay. They they were converts there. Right. Why? How were they converts? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Christians went there. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. All the way back to Pentecost, the gospel came to Rome through those Roman Jewish believers that would have gone. And those Roman believers led their friends and led Gentiles 
shared the gospel with them and led them to Christ. Now, again, y'all, this is so, uh, the only reason I'm stopping here and really making sure you know this answer is because how good of a form do you think they had? Not that great of a form. And that's the whole reason that Paul's writing this book is to give them a better form, to give them a better form of teaching to which they're to be committed to. Does that make sense? So he says, listen, I know you've done good with what you've had to work with, basically, but I'm going to give you more. And he, and he says in verse 18, and having been freed from sin, from sin I know that you, you Roman people, you in these little house churches have become slaves of righteousness. In verse 19, he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, the weakness of us just being humans, right? For just as you present your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness. So again, think through that verse. As you yield your members, and, and not just the members of our body. I mean, it can be the members of our physical body, right? We would certainly say that with like sexual sin, right? You could literally yield yourself, put yourself in positions where you would be compromised. But there's all kinds of other members of ourselves, right? Our mind, our heart, our feelings, our attitudes. I want you all to think about when it talks about the members that make us up, that he's not just talking about our fingers and our foot and our toes. He's talking about every part of us, our emotional thoughts, our feelings, our minds. All of that are members of our humanness. Are y'all with me on that? Mm -hmm. And think about what are some of the ways that we yield ourselves, that we give ourselves over to impurity and lawlessness. Now, if we can't figure that out, we'll never have control over sin. Because the counter of this is that, and isn't this a true statement, in my life, in everybody's life, is that the more you present yourself as slaves to this impurity and lawlessness, guess what it does? It results in more lawlessness. It's just like you do something wrong, then you have to tell a lie to cover it up, right? I mean, it's just constant, right? And so the, what he's going to say is, that to me, this is the secret of sanctification. Because now he's going to say the opposite side of that is now present your members as slaves to righteousness resulting in sanctification. Now, I want you all to be thinking because we're going to close with this thought. And um, I'm just going to read these verses really quick, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask you this question. Is what are some very physical, tangible ways that we can yield our members, yield ourselves, our physical bodies, our minds, our hearts, our attitudes, our feelings, everything that makes us up as human beings? How can we yield our Selves to slaves of righteousness, which results in sanctification. So I'm going to ask you that in a minute, but I'm going to read this to just finish it up. He says, for when you were slaves of sin, and I'm doing this because I'm thinking of the field, when you were, by the way, when I watch myself on tape, it's really ridiculous how much I talk with my hands. I'm so sorry. Anyhow, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free. In regard to righteousness righteousness is over here it can't make any demands on you it's not your boss right it's the new boss so righteousness is not making demands on you 
You may be like, yeah, that makes sense. But here's the beautiful thing is that it goes the other way too, that when you're over here, lawlessness should not be able to make demands of you. You can say, you know what? You're not my boss anymore. I don't work for you. I don't draw a paycheck from you. You're not my boss. I don't have to yield myself to you. I don't have to submit to you. Sin, I don't have to. And he says, therefore, what benefit were you when you're deriving from the things in which you're now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now you've been freed from sin and enslaved to God. You derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome of which is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so in this whole idea, he's saying that when you were over here, you were enslaved to sin and you benefited, you got your wages from this, and in the end, you got death. That's, that's what your end wage was. But the beautiful thing is over here, the benefit that you get that comes out is a life that is sanctified and that the wages of this life is eternal life. So it's just this beautiful contrast through this entire book that gives us some hints to how to live this sanctified life. So now I'm going to go back to the question that I asked. And I, the question that I'm going to ask that's really the question for us every day as we wake up is how can I yield myself to be a slave of righteousness? What does that look like? And I want you to just, you can just flip what yielding yourself to sin looks like because it's the opposite of that, right? What does that look like? What's some of the things? Well, I think you have to be intentional with your day. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not in the Word, it's easy, easier for sin to take over. Whereas if you're in the Word and you're listening and you let it speak to you, mm -hmm. then it kind of directs you for the day. Absolutely. Um, if you start out in the morning with praise, then you're likely to have that better attitude of praise for God for things and when things go wrong. As so true. And what is such a perfect example is all of us know when you, they, there's a little saying that we say, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed, <laughs> right? And what does that usually mean that you get to do the rest of the day? Be in a bad mood. Be in a bad mood. Now, now listen, I know I have bad days too, but really by even giving yourself that excuse, I woke up on the bad side of the bed today, and so I'm just gonna be not kind to people all day long. I'm gonna be in a bad mood all day long. Have I not yielded myself? And the opposite of that is don't have it be a bad side of the bed, you know? Somehow, yield yourself to God's word, yield yourself to praising him in the morning, and isn't it so true? One of the things that um, I always tell you is that if, I know you're super busy, but if you could kick off your Bible study by doing a little on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you know the reason why is then you percolate in it. You kind of sat, you kind of think about it all week long. For me, it's key because um, I won't be thinking about it. So that's exactly right. What are some other ways? Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, to, so that's something you have to be intentional to do and, you know, and have him and ask him to remind you, this is my time for you today, not your time. Right, right. And in that yielding, um, wouldn't that take away a lot of our anxiety, mm -hmm. a lot of our fear, mm -hmm. a lot of our, personally for me, a lot of my anger, that when my day gets messed up, when someone messes up my schedule, when the school calls because my child is throwing up um, and it kind of 
ruins my whole day, which doesn't happen anymore, so that's why I used it as an illustration. But um, what else? What's another way? I think it's a lot to just in the little things in the beginning to let yourself make those excuses and to settle, you know, like not telling that white lie, you yeah. know, it would make your life easier. Yeah. Not leaving the kid's child on the bathroom floor, even though you tried to pick it up, you know, like right, we're right. not drop, you know, driving with yeah. the speed over the speed limit, it could, not cheating on your taxes, things that right. are acceptable to people. If you let yourself get away with that, what else will you yeah. do yourself do? Like, yeah, I love that. It's a great one. Kelly, you had your hand up too, honey. Um, it, it's something that like happens a lot more over time, but it also steers me to like, like we all have to make sacrifices to make sure that we're not doing these things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they can be something like really small, like you were saying, like for work mm -hmm. and you don't speed, and right. that is a sacrifice, but it's more on a small scale. But sometimes yeah. they're really big, and they look like stepping away from a toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. and Right, and, and ladies, I want you to hear none of this is legalism. None of this is giving you a methodology to be righteous. You know, if I just do all the things, oh, did it quit? No, it's just saying low battery, so it's, that's on your screen. Okay. Um, all of these things is not some kind of recipe for righteousness. I want you all to hear this because this is the beautiful thing about being in relationship with God. For each of us, it's something different. It may be for some of us, you know, to make sure that we get a good night's sleep, mm -hmm. to, you know, not stay up and, and watch TV when you're all by yourself at midnight because you know what you're going to watch by yourself is not as, you know, what you would want your kids to see you watching. I mean, it can be all different things. Another huge one, nobody has said this one yet. Anybody have something else? Because, yes, Caitlin I, Rose. I wanted to say two things. Um, the first one, I would say, like, because there's people who aren't on this side, mm -hmm. that the first thing they'd have to do is accept Christ. Right. Into their hearts and stuff. Um, and confess their sin and that right. whole deal. And then the second thing was surround yourself with other Christians That's who exactly will right. call you out. <laughs> That's exactly right. Because so. we know we're going to have people in our lives who are going to want to pull us down. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, it's so funny that we use kind of that illustration, some with our kids, and it's always easier to pull somebody down than it is to pull somebody up. Mm -hmm. and the thing of it is, I, I'll tell you what, that never changes for me. At 50 years old, it is still true for me that who I surround myself with dictates so much how I yield my members. Mm -hmm. And that if, if, if it's people who encourage kind of that, if it's, you know, negative people, gossipy people, you know, that is so easy to seep in. So I think you're exactly right. Just like presenting your members is by hanging out with people who bring you down. The opposite of that would be to hang out with people, intentionally put people in your life that encourage your walk with Christ, right? And who will call you out when, <laughs> like... I mean, we don't always know when we're sinning. <laughs> so yeah. if you have someone you trust and you love who is also following Christ, they can be like, oh. Yeah, and even more that we don't always know when we're sinning, we may not know sometimes those little things that lead to it. Mm. And they may see things in our lives that they can say, you know, um, I think this and this, that maybe you wouldn't get so angry if you thought about it this way, or, you know, they, so before we even sit. So anything else? Yes, Michelle. I know, um, Steve Canfield, he has actually had one of the things that has stuck with John and I for years is through the short list mm. of sins. So confess your sins daily, instantly, against God, confess to him, the sin against your child, you know, be transparent and honest and ask for forgiveness. Don't simmer in your sins. Mm. That's so good. And 
one of the things I learned really early on and that I've tried to practice is that when I'm reflecting on a conversation and I just, something about something I said felt kind of, I'll go back to the person and say, listen, if, if, if I sinned against you or if you took this the wrong way or I, I try to go back and keep short accounts with people as well um, and just say, you know, I'm really sorry that I said that or I really talked negative about that person and I'm really sorry. Um, and that, you know, it's such a challenge in our lives. Um, for me, that's one of the biggest ones is my personality is that I want everything to be fair in life. And I want it all to like, I, I cannot stand the idea of being misunderstood and for people to not have the right idea or thoughts about something. And it's really trusting God for those things because what leads me sometimes to that temptation of wanting to um, say more than I need to say is um, feeling like I've got to make everything right. And the thing of it is, is I don't. God is my refuge and my strength, and he's my strong tower that I can run into. I mean, I just, all of those verses mean so much to me because it, it makes me keep my mouth shut, which for me is a challenge. I just keep my mouth shut. I think a lot of the sin that we run into is habitual sin. other down and gave each other excuses but also in being successful finally in doing that I had to set up other habits uh -huh. when I was when I felt an urge to smoke um, or whatever your habitual sin is right I had to go okay I know that this is going to happen right I know that I'm going to get this urge right um, and so when that happens or even before that happens I'm going to Right, right, right. I'm going to make a habit of doing this. I did the most ridiculous things. I smoked straws. Um, right. I mean, I ate lots of cookies. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, but you you have to have a, a plan in place. This this is my area of weakness. Right. This is where the enemy is going to attack me, or this is where I'm going to fall into habitual sin, and I right. know it. And so, before I even have a chance to do that, um, you know, if you're on a diet, I try and keep a banana or a sliced apple with me so that when I'm yeah. really hungry, instead of grabbing a slice, Right. You know. Isn't that such a great example that in that same way that we keep a banana with us and an apple with us to keep us from eating the wrong food, what about if we thought about our spiritual lives like that and we kept an index card with a scripture on it? Or do you know what I mean? Like you are thinking ahead how to not present yourself, um, you know, yield yourself to that vending machine. Or yield yourself to that known temptation and we think more clearly about that in dieting than we do other areas of our lives so why we have to prepare ourselves right be prepared and have the word in our heart yeah 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 so that when, when you right. have the true you're armed with the truth when you run up against the lie that's gonna knock you off course yeah yeah absolutely all right so we're totally out of time I'm so sorry we're late um, it's hard to cover a whole chapter but I'm so excited. Y'all make sure if you haven't had time to do all your homework, there's some fabulous words you're going to look up. Um, and so I'm so excited for this next week of work. And it's going to help us more kind of set the foundation, set the form, set the mold of this whole teaching on sanctification. What we're going to learn this week is going to help in that too. Let me pray for us. God, we love you. We thank you that you do make us slaves to righteousness, God. And uh, God, that as we're going to look at this week, that new creation that you make us and that um, really um, before we come to you, it is really we don't have as much choice um, as it relates to sin. But God, we, we do. We can choose to live a life 
free of those things that um, break fellowship with you. And God, I just pray that as we live out this week, that we will just think through um, what we've studied tonight. We'll think through what we're looking at this week of what it means to be identified with you completely. And God, that um, you would just continue to break strongholds in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.